Surveying how speech can always provide a collateral course to pursue when the apparent aim is not apparently to be achieved. Such as the easy example being that uh, in religion, of people attempting to please a God, uh, make the rabbi or the priest happy, instead of more directly looking after lives and thus your own direct personal individual interest, if that would be possible. You know, like the, hey, since fiscal forecasting is invalid, let's raise some funds and chair, fund an, a chair in economics over at the university. That as long as men are talking, then the very areas where he would seem to be failing to achieve an aim, as long as there is a collateral aim possible, and there's always the possibility of a possibility, if it's something being talked about, then there is a kind of quite direct and real secondary form of success. And still the easiest example staying for a second on religion, I wanted to make another note that in this kind of collateral affair that is not normally seen as being success, that is that men and institutions seem to state a name and then cannot fulfill the aim but still talk about it, and I'm trying to get you to see that on the basis of talk being one of the primary requirements of life now, that as long as you're talking about whatever the secondary affair is, which is based on talk or it wouldn't exist, that as long as you're talking about it, the ideas of success, which is always a verbal affair because you have to verbally describe what success will be as opposed to the silent primary, the other three primary of sex. Well, we're calling them three. There might be 3,000, but you know, let's, let's give the human brain a break of sex, shelter, and sustenance, the three X's, that they can be fulfilled silently. But there is no such thing as a secondary aim unless it can be described. It does not exist, no matter how you try to cut it. If it's beyond that realm, if it's actually beyond that, which would just minimally be required to keep one just alive, Anything beyond that, no matter what it seems to be religion, culturally, artistically, religiously based, whatever it is, if it cannot be described, it does not exist. There is no such thing. So there is a built-in kind of energy efficiency that is not normally noted to wit that if somebody, if a human can talk about an aim, there is already success in the win. To talk about the aim, to apparently say, well, here are Here's what we should be doing with this science. Here's what we should be doing with our human efforts. If you can describe it, there is already built-in success. It is then up to humanity, like the running battle between the chickens and the corn, since that met with such great, I saw so many people immediately <laughs> take notes. But <coughs> uh, If you don't like that, between uh, the critics and the artists back and forth and back and forth. And then the artist, of course, criticizes the critics for being people with no talent. But as long as that's going on, do you understand, that becomes part of the success. But there is a piece of success. There is a foundation of success already established when an aim is verbalized, no matter where it is. If inside of a religion, inside of philosophy, inside some cultural institution, if they say, wait a minute, here's what we should be doing, and it apparently is a new aim. It is already the foundations of success. Now, it may die. It may not leave much further past the hearing of those who were witness to, orally, the person who stated it. But assuming it takes on some sort of life and gets outside the room and filters through the community that would be interested, there is the foundation of success. In other words, it will never be sans, totally sans success. Because if it has been stated that here's what we should do, as soon as the person describes here's what we should do, and it seems to be a whole new area. No matter what they say after that, even if they say, now, boy, this is really, we're going to have our hands full and we cannot expect immediate success. We may not see success in our lifetime. Then go on and on and on. And there is already a discernible degree of success by describing the aim. So even though that be true, I wanted to, and to use religion, since it's the easiest example, that there seems to be without any doubt, 
you don't have to be a religious critic, there seems to be a great observable chasm between what men say that they should be doing religiously, moralistically, and what they actually do. But men can live in a primary state. They can live a primary life that would be outside of some secondary, some stated secondary structure, which all, second, which all secondary structures have got to be said, as I was just pointing out. But they can live an actual life of deeds that are outside some secondary verbal structure, such as a religion. They can do so. But it, and as long as they will speak in a manner that is collateral with, in a manner that is compatible to the verbal structure, such as they in religion, then they are adequately, they are still embraced, they are a part of the institution. Did that get convoluted enough? Let's put it simple. Uh... Amidst all the historical and contemporary debate and wrangling over the apparent conflict between man's words and man's deeds, which you could look at as being a conflict represented between the difference between, instead of just words and deeds, you could look at it as being the secondary and the primary world. Out of that comes what ordinary people consider to be a quite odious matter of hypocrisy. And may I point out to you that if you can see in a kind of subversive way, hypocrisy, let's just use their description of it, which is a description that is a noting of the disparity, disparity between men's words and men's deeds. May I point out to you that hypocrisy, as they call it, is not a sin. It's not even an anomaly. They're what men are driven to call hypocrisy is at the minimal level in city terms a sign of robust health. <laughs> From a more revolutionist view this by the way you might care to note is the specious basis for all sarcasm and irony. Now, again, don't lose track that from an ordinary view, the attack of hypocrisy, that is the attack that men individually, men collectively, they talk a certain way, and then look how they act. Now, back, of course, at the ordinary level, it didn't seem to strike anybody. As, uh, at an individual level, hypocrisy is used as somebody accused of being like a Sunday Christian. That, yeah, the, oh, so-and-so, my neighbor, my brother-in-law, uh, he'll say he's a, a religious person. He'll say he's a Christian or whatever. And he'll go maybe once a week. I think they used to call them like Christmas Christians. Like the only time you see old so-and-so in church is at Christmas. Or if he's sick or somebody dies. What a hypocrite. And he'll stand there in his business and he'll attack other people for being deadbeats and... Uh, He'll gossip about people and being involved in the neighborhood uh, and extramarital affairs. He will wave around the ideas of religion and then look at the way he lives. You can find him out at bars on Saturday night. You can find him at bars on Sunday, not in church. What a hypocrite. It is the specific and it is a valid notice of a difference between the secondary and the primary world. Oops, I'm sorry. They would call it the difference between a man's words and his deeds. But notice, a subtle part, so that you don't think you missed it all, it may not be worth it, but I was trying to slip you back up. At the ordinary level, the way things operate, that kind of Sunday Christian, part-time Jew, whatever it is, it is acceptable on this basis that they can live a non fill in the blank, a non-Christian, non-Muslim life, if, which would be primary, that they can sleep around, they can be drunk, they can eat non-kosher food if they have dietary restrictions in their religion. They can do, they can live 
That is, the, word, the life of deeds, not words. They can live, in the primary, an un-Christian life. Which is all right. It is acceptable by life. Forget the religion. It is acceptable by life, including the religion, but that's not the point. It is acceptable so long as the person in the world of words will talk in a way that is compatible with, that is collateral to, the religion. Now, I know all of you think you missed it. What did, i.e., how about this? As long as they express guilt. Does that sound more familiar? <laughs> no religion anywhere on this planet. No, none of the mainstream religions will play broken-hearted lover, upset father, and say, go from my door, just because a person doesn't live by their rules. Can't put a period there. They can say, oh yes, we will not allow people here who will not live by the rules. Are you sure of that? Well, what do you, mean? you mean people who won't try. Well, yeah, people, certainly people won't try. We're all human. So, you can live a non-Christian life if you will talk in a way that is compatible to, that is collateral with, that which you're failing to do. What do you mean? Well, as long as you'll confess that you're not quite cutting it yet. Well, yeah, okay, yeah. Do you hear? Now, this goes on and certainly is looked at in a different way at street level because the people involved, such as the Catholic, well, all religions, but the Catholic Church, since they've got confession, they would say, well, prayer and confessing that you have missed the mark again is indeed an integral an inescapable part of being a good blank, Christian Jew, whatever. And the, the head rabbi, the priest, the pope will say, none of us are perfect. Unless he's playing that part of that revolutionist that said he made no mistake. They'll all say, no, we are all imperfect and we've all fallen short of doing all of that which we know we should. And so some idea of perfection, that's beyond us. That's not it. Do you hear? That's something again that you're past any point of being critical of religion or being a supporter of it. I'm talking about the movement of energy and what makes life run. In the secondary, and in the secondary, words, according to how sharp you are, they are the fuel tank or they are the fuel. You can work on that to see where you are on the scheme, the food chain, and a new time zone. But words are the fuel of it at the very basic level. So it is not that it's an excuse in religion, and it's not simply that, well, the gods have arranged things so that none of us can actually meet the real requirements, but it keeps us, you know, hustling along and you know, brings in a few couples to, so we can, you know, the new building fund, et cetera. I don't know. Look at it on a brighter, much broader range, and it's beyond religion. You can get now into ordinary human relationships. A couple of atheists living together. Boy, you're a terrible woman. I can't stand up with you. You go against everything I believe in. Oh, I'll do better. Oh, okay, come here. <laughs> that is, as long as the primary attraction is still there. Now, I was taking the male part since <laughs> well, it was the easiest for me to do. As a man say at the primary level, what he's saying is, I still like screwing you, but boy, you make me mad that you're flirting with other people, that you called your mother and I told you not to call her long distance anymore. You just won't do anything right, will you? And she says, you're right, I'm sorry, I'll do better. Oh, okay, come here. And vice versa. It's the same thing. As long as the person, being a conduit for energy, and it coming out verbally in the secondary world, as long as the person will talk, that's the secondary manifestation, that's the words in that great battle between chickens and corn. I'm sorry, words and deeds. That was it. In that great conflict, as long as you will secondarily talk in such a way that is compatible to, that represents a collateral course to the world of deeds which you're not following. That is, son, are you being a good Christian? You mean if I quit uh, fooling around with uh, my neighbor's wife? Yeah. You mean if I quit drinking? Yeah. No, I hadn't done that. Well, but God, I feel terrible about it. Okay, come on in. Come on, come on in. 
Now forget churches and et cetera. It's life. It's the mainstream of life. It is the health, the robustness of life. As long as you're doing that, you are succeeding. Hypocrisy, amongst other things, gets from a revolutionist view an exceptionally, an egregiously bad rap. <laughs> hearing hypocrisy in the air, it's like hearing birds sing. <laughs> it's like hearing with a stethoscope on, on the breathing apparatus of humanity. It's just clear. It sounds like a two-year-old kid that jogs 10 miles a day. <laughs> You can hear the blood warm and bubbling. That's what hypocrisy is. As opposed to, if I have to put it to you another way, if everything was succeeding such as religion, if a religion, if the individuals in the institution, if all Catholics suddenly became not just Sunday Catholics, but became real Catholics, forget talking, forget guilt, that suddenly all Catholics, oh, all right, within two days, all Catholics can live, that is, do the deed, as it's written, whatever they call it, whatever the list of, here it is to be a Catholic. If they could do that, it would be what? It would be the Catholic Church had visited Jamestown. Jonestown. Not Jamestown. That's right, they disappeared too. <laughs> it, would be, it would be suicidal is the point. That if any, if any secondary activity succeeds, not literally succeeds, it's gone. It's suicidal. That is not the point. Secondary aims are not to be achieved. Secondary institutions are not to succeed. Secondary ideas are not to be fulfilled. That's not it. Secondary dreams and wishes are not to come true. It's, to, it's for them to not come true so you can go to bed and, go, and dream about them, get up and go, well, here it is. By God, I'll get closer today. Maybe yes, maybe no. According to what kind of limited 3D surveying abilities you've got. It doesn't matter. You can say, I'm getting closer, I'm getting further away. Of course, nobody wants to consider the fact that life may be holding your glasses back and forth. <laughs> Just a little joke. <laughs> Dead more gave you the blues. You're going to look at it another way in a 3D closet. You're not ever going to get any further any closer away anyway. But you got to think you do. I mean, if you think, well, I'm just staying here in one place. No matter what I do, that far wall is right where it was 20 years ago. Oh, that's not good. Oh. <laughs> that can really get neurally claustrophobic or phobic. But at any rate, assuming that all of you got have some grasp on that, that there is this gap between what people can say they aim to do and what they do do. Even though this gap exists, even though it is natural and necessary for our routine existence, still when you get down to ordinary talk being ordinarily a matter in this context of it being success tomorrow, that that is the nature of it, that is the health of it, and there is a gap that is not going to be filled between a man's words and a man's deeds, between a man's dreams and what seems to happen. That if they are fulfilled at the primary level, again, if a dream is actually fulfilled, a dream is finished. If you are hungry, not as they want to call it psychologically hungry, whatever the hell that is, but if you're actually hungry and your dream is, or you're on the desert, maybe that's plainer, crawling, thirst, that is your dream, and you suddenly get over a dune and there's a glass of water. In your dream, you only have one dream in life, right then, as you might imagine. Water! And you get water? What is it? That dream is gone. You're a man, pardon the expression, sans dream. <laughs> that dream is gone. There is no such dream. So there is this gap in the secondary world that is seen as being filled by the accusation of hypocrisy. It's the place where sarcasm springs forth in the oasis. Irony, and which as I said is really stupid because from a more complex view, being sarcastic about men's shortcomings, that is their hypocrisy, 
is attacking the health of life. Back to where we were just then. So even though this is natural, even though there is this gap that will never be crossed, not supposed to be crossed, even though men's talk, their success is always a matter of success tomorrow. It's what makes secondary world a world of success. That even though that's true, that that kind of talk is not sufficient for any extraordinary purpose. What we laughingly, lovingly, and figuratively refer to it around here is for revolutionist purposes. Talking of success tomorrow is a hobby. You can still do it. I would hope as your Christmas present to yourself that you wouldn't believe it or that you wouldn't listen to it. But it is not sufficient for any extraordinary purpose, intellectual purpose. A new revolutionist has got to do more and got to say more than just that which might get you by for the present. And rather than that phrase being in any manner, don't say pejorative, pejorative. <coughs> As we noted a few nights ago, that is a valid, admirable, honorable description of speech in the secondary world. The secondary world operates on the basis, and I just put it this way, having to make some sort of outline within the grays inside of a three-dimensional closet because it's not an attack in any way, but the secondary world operates on the basis of just what will get you by. Not the individual. It's not some attempted psychological excuse for the frailties of humanity. The secondary world itself, each and every second, is doing just that which will get it by, which is a whole other story, but that gives rise in a, another kind of nebulous way to the kinds of attacks that seem to be so justified from intellectual, forward-thinking people in the city. That is, at last falling apart. And they can prove it. Hell, I can stand here and prove it. You can. You can start arguing in such a way, probably if you were listening, you'd give yourself the willies. And think, Jesus, I gotta go off this planet or get out of town. We're killing ourselves. Because life at the secondary, which is a verbal description of the primary, and some of its blooms, some of the ivy growing up its tree, some of the rice, well, we don't want to go into that. <laughs> but it is always operating in a quite real sense. If we got outside three dimensions, this is invalid, but you know, who's going to get outside and prove me wrong? At the three-dimensional level, life is literally, at each and every second, the secondary realm is doing just that which will get it by. That's it. And I was saying that's the kind of fumes, in a sense, that kind of seep under the door into the closet and make people go, I just know it, Bernice. Life is just on the edge of falling apart. People saying that October the, whatever it is, 23rd, 1991. And people were saying that October the 23rd, 1991, B.C., I can just feel it. I can feel it. Something is drastically wrong. And the whole secondary world goes, ooh, me too. <laughs> to do anything extraordinary, to actually move your own nervous system, this part, into a different time zone while you're still alive here, requires, not for any reason, was a little joke in Cairo for the last several nights, that one reason this kind of thing is never popular is although it would seem to be encouraging change like many other things, this sort of thing can never answer the question. If indeed we take it as a given that's encouraging change, then it cannot answer the question from out there about, well, in what way? You know, because who's going to... Yeah. And there's several questions, of course, like why, which is the one we kind of discarded that about a week ago, if you were listening, of why this can't really get to be real commercial is that when it comes to, you should be thinking differently. This can never answer the question, 
Just a simple question. Well, why? Not a smart-ass question, just for the rest of the world. Of course, they couldn't do it. If they could, they'd say, well, that sounds interesting, but why should I? There is no answer. Not that anybody would ask that question. <laughs> or it just seemed to be that this is encouraging change. Or else why would a man make a hand gesture? <laughs> it's encouraging change. That's what hand gestures mean. Because if you're down the secondary world, hand gestures don't mean change. If we're back at the primary level, hand gestures only have one or two valid manifestations. Right. You know, just Im important thing. <laughs> At any rate, what we're trying to cover was to do anything extraordinary, whatever you tried to call it, but what you're really trying to do is move your nervous system past the point of just what's necessary right now. And that there's some kind of change possible, or you wouldn't be here unless we're all nuts. I'm talking about serious nuts, of course. Serious. Triple, triple deck. So this obviously has to do with change, but it cannot answer the question, which does not based on overt someone asking, you're supposed to hear this inside your own nervous system to yourself, is why am I trying to do this? And there is no answer. Because if there is an answer, then what are your nervous system telling you? Whatever part of your nervous system will give you an answer about why you should change? Trust me, this is an operational... In other words, you're making a mistake. Forget whether it's between you and somebody else or you and listening to this kind of stuff. If you ask your... You know, you're operating on the basis, I should change which we've already been through, that's part of the nervous system. That's part of being alive is to feel uncomfortable, feel incomplete, and if you're ordinary, feel guilty. You know, why? Well, I'm alive. That's heartbreaking. No, it's not. I just said that. It's actually heartbreaking. You know, you didn't like the guy that said it was hard enough being alive without having to think about it? <laughs> because an ordinary person, if they think about it, they think one thing. You don't have to be a mind reader. If you ask somebody, are you alive? And they say yes. And you say, do you, ever th do you think about being alive? Well, certainly. <laughs> then you don't have to, you know, find a turban. Or you don't have to think, is it possible? I can tell you, you can read their mind. All you got to know. Well, you can say, are you ordinary? And they go, yeah. Because <laughs> if you got to ask them, you're so ordinary, you wouldn't know anyway. But anyway, are you ordinary? Yeah. Are you alive? Well, certainly. Do you ever think about being alive? Yes. Then you don't have to worry about, oh, I wish I could read minds. There's nothing else to read. They're alive. They feel I should be changing. I should be doing something. And so to yourself, you didn't lose your place. It's not institutional. It's not between you and somebody else. Ultimately, it's you feeling like, yes, I should change. Because that's the only reason you're watching this, doing this, just sitting around. You'd just be sitting in one position, but now you would take taken root and probably become the world's largest mushroom or something. <laughs> and so if you're out moving around in the secondary world, it's on the basis that you're alive and that you feel properly so, which is the secondary world is always incomplete, that I should be changing. But then to entertain a question even from yourself is, well, yes, I should be changing, but how? If you do that, then you're back ordinary because then it'll be, well... I should lose weight. Maybe you should. Who the hell knows? Who the hell cares? Unless it's, you know, physically making you sick. Maybe I should be richer. Now, who the hell cares? Maybe you should. I don't care. But on the basis that, yes, I should change, in what way? Of course, it's too late then. My answers are just sham sarcasm. Dramatic irony. Because if you ask the question again, well, like, well, in what way? You're already ordinary. Because there is no answer. Any answer you get is things specific and it's still secondary. That's what drives the secondary world. Yes, I should change. The whole world says that. That doesn't make you any kind of exceptional unusual person. That doesn't show any insight. A man laying in the gutter. Are you satisfied with that? <laughs> what are you, nuts? What I want to do is set my money and move to a better gutter. Aren't you sick of drinking that cheap wine? You're damn right. Give me some money and I'll buy some better wine. To say, well, that, that's being silly. I have great metaphysical. I have great dreams, intellectual, artistic, that I want to change. Well, how so? Well, I, how wonderful you to ask, and people will tell you. But you don't have to listen to them because you've already read their mind. 
If you ask the question, which is already, you've got a fait accompli of stupidity already, but then to entertain the answer that it's from you, forget anybody else, that, well, yes, I should, and whatever it is, that's no good. That is not an operational dynamic of being a revolutionist. So there is no answer. That it obviously is promoting change, but it cannot answer the question. And when I say it, forget it and forget my right hand. You're, it's yourself. Well, yes, I should change. There's no doubt about that. Okay, oh, Roy, what should we do? Well, first off, we should, you don't even have to listen. It's a quite decent hobby, and you may be dancing. You may now, whatever your name is, take on the partnership with Irene Castle since she <laughs> lost her other old man. <laughs> but don't, wor don't worry about what kind of step you're going to do because I can tell you where you're going to be dancing. You're going to be dancing right here on the floor with everybody else. And so there is no answer about how you should change because at that level you can't change. It is only at the level where change is impertinent, where there is no answer, much less a question about, all right, I know I should change, but how? That's, that's the closest answer, which is, of course, another cow root. God, I quote that son of a bitch. Or well, I refer to him. Uh, about if a person... A revolutionist used what everybody else calls sarcasm on himself that would be a different bird, which is, you know, that's not somebody else. That's not the somebody else. Jesus. And it's not even really to yourself. I'm just being dramatic. Because if you're, if you're capable of doing that, you wouldn't be insulted anyway. I mean, if you had any basis of being a revolutionist to tell yourself, like, get screwed, or to say something real smart ass to yourself, I mean, if you think that's a big deal, then you ain't a big deal to even hear it that way. At any rate, <clears throat> if you're going to do something extraordinary, you're trying to change, but you have got to do more, slice, you have got to say more, which is covering both realms. But it's really the say more that we're talking about. Not see more, it's say more. We already <laughs> covered see more. You have got to be doing more than just what will get you by. And just what will get you by, remember, is not in any way a censure of how people ordinarily work, because that's the way life works at the secondary level. So there's nothing wrong. And so you have got to do more, you have got to say more than just what will get you by. And you have got to, how is this for people who like to believe, what is it, and reincarnation and all that? We're about to end up, and I'm about to say that next time we'll pick up, and I'm about to say the same thing I said Monday night. That's how far we got. In other words, it's getting to the point that I said we're going to start this time. <laughs> But how could you believe me when I said I love you when you know I've been a liar all my life? <laughs> Anybody old enough to know that's old enough to know what Irene Castle's husband's name was, damn it. You're just holding out on me. <laughs> At any rate, the neural subversive also, I was going to say we're going to have to end it, but also be moving closer as opposed to the kind of talk about always success tomorrow, which is valid and proper. But he would have to be, or she would have to be moving closer to what I was going to try to get you to see as a kind of thinking in real time, just in the sense it's used today. It would be a kind of intellectual activity which is not demanded, is not necessary, but would be closer to a kind of thinking in real time than what is across the board valid and operational for everybody else. That success is always a matter of tomorrow. That it is the ultimate operational defense, if it needed, to hypocrisy, to sarcastic charges of a man being a failure, of a man being a moral cripple, of a man being an intellectual failure. That is, boy, you talk a good game, but you, you know, look at the way you're acting. Look at the way you live. And whether he answers it directly or not, what he's saying is, hey, as long as there's tomorrow, as long as we can talk about it, I got a chance. That is success. That is life itself getting by on just what is possible, just what will get you by right now. He says it ain't right now. It's always tomorrow. And for somebody attempting to do something extraordinary, I just, I hate to end like this, but that ain't going to quite cut it. And speaking of cut it... <laughs>